Our Bible reading tonight is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and reading from verses 1 to 11. 1 Corinthians 6, beginning at verse 1. If any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This is God's word. <clears throat> well, uh, we've got tonight Christians suing each other. We've got Christians who are going to judge angels and judge the world. We've got the kingdom of God. We've got homosexuals. We've got drunks. We've got the Trinity's work in salvation. Uh, so there is a bit here. But despite a lot going on in this passage, Paul is not just giving random random things, random topics here. He is building a case. He is, he is using all of this uh, for a point. And uh, hopefully, uh, by God's help, we'll see what that uh, point is tonight. You've been doing a lot of sitting uh, because we haven't been uh, singing tonight or standing. So uh, as I pray, you understand with me. Uh, you can stretch your legs and we'll pray uh, together. Please stand. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. We thank you for our gathering. Lord, what a, what a privilege it was just to participate uh, in communion together as brothers and sisters in Christ, to remember what Christ has done. Thank you for that special time, Lord. May you refresh us even through that as we recall all that you've done for us in Christ, a great salvation. And now, Lord, we come to sit and hear your word to receive your word, and we pray, O oh God, that you would, uh, you would really give us understanding in this passage. May you change us. May you shape us. May you cause us to see what it is that you want us uh, to work out in our lives, what it is you want us to, see about, uh, us to see about yourself, what it is you want us to change, uh, what your will is for our lives, how we can please you and live lives worthy of the gospel. Really, we're in desperate need of the help of the Holy Spirit. 
may he powerfully work among us. And Lord, may, may the power be seen belonging to you and to no man. We pray that you would be pleased to reveal Christ to us once again. Show us more of him. Show us his greatness. May we live in awe of him. And may you purify us through this time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Uh, as Ian had just uh, mentioned in communion, Christians are radically new people. They've, they've been, Christians are those who have been recreated, remade as it were. There's been a powerful work within them through the new birth by the Spirit. But nevertheless, sin and temptation are always, even for these new creatures that we are, sin and temptation are always crouching at the door. So there is a wonderful hymn that was written many, many years ago, and Christians of all ages have sung it tearfully as they recalled their own sinfulness. Let me uh, share with you some of the words of that famous hymn. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. The reality is that Christians can wander and that we can give in greatly to sin. Now, one of the ways that God, one of the means God uses to bring wandering Christians back, straying Christians, disobedient Christians back, one of the means that he's used it, uh, he uh, chooses to use are uh, warnings and rebukes. Warning, warnings and rebukes. Now, it's never, ple- it's never pleasant to offer someone a rebuke, to, to rebuke someone, to call them out, or to give them a strong warning. It's never pleasant to offer that, and it's never pleasant to receive it. Never. And so one of the things that Christians have tend to do now is, instead of rebuking, instead of warning, we just go for encouragement, no matter what the situation is. So if someone's struggling, they're really, really struggling, we encourage them, and rightfully so. But if someone's in outright sin, if they're being unfaithful, if they're living ungodly, what do we do? Well, we just encourage them. Try and encourage them, and, and hopefully they'll change. Encouragement is necessary, but rebuking and warning is necessary also. Both of these go hand in hand, and we're all called to do it for each other. Listen to Titus 2. Look at the balance. Titus 2.15. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Encourage and rebuke. Both of them are necessary for straying Christians, and Paul uses both of these means tonight in this passage here to bring these straying Christians back, these Corinthians. So firstly, if you've got your text, please keep it open so that you can follow with me. 1 Corinthians 6, uh, in verse 1, we see the issue uh, that Paul's dealing with here. Look at the issue. Is this really loud? It feels loud up here. No? Okay. Verse 1. If any of you has a dispute with one another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? So what's it like? What would it have been like being part of the Corinthian church? What would it have been like being there? Well, what have we seen so far? You'd turn up to a service, and when you walk in, you'd see the church sitting in different sections, in their parties, in their factions because they'd taken sides against each other. So you'd see that. Last week we saw it was common knowledge among the congregation, even celebrated that a man was sleeping with his stepmother. They boasted in that fact, and it gets worse. It gets worse tonight. Church members taking advantage over one another. Church members cheating one another in business and in finance, in money, to the extent of even suing one another taking each other to court. And so you turn up on Sunday to to church at Corinth, and as you go to take a seat, someone pulls you aside and they say to you, hey, by the way, did you hear that Jerry is suing Tony? And he's going to try and take him for everything that he's got. That was happening in church, in, in, in the one congregation. And so last week we see incest in the church, Tonight we see Christians suing each other, and next week 
Paul's going to have to deal with them visiting prostitutes. Church at Corinth. And yet, out of all of this and things that are still yet to come in the letter, it seems that the Christians suing each other seems to outra- uh, outrage the Apostle Paul the most. This one seems to get under his skin the most. Christians who feel no shame in taking their brothers and sisters to court. Now, in secular society, taking, taking someone to court was just part of the norm. I mean, you, you just did that in Paul's day. That's what unbelievers did. And really, nothing's changed today. Actually, it's increased, right? Here's a shocking statistic for you. In 2019, it was recorded record and estimated that in America, there were 40 million lawsuits filed just in America, America alone, 40 million. That's more than one lawsuit filed every second of the year. That's, that's secular society, right? That's what we should expect. And yet, the church had adopted this and thought this is acceptable even for us in the midst of our community and our relationships with one another. Now, we don't exactly know what the court case was going on in the church, but we can kind of piece it together. Verse 8, there's a bit of a clue there. He says, you wrong one another and you cheat one another. It seems that they are, there's financial fraud going on here, greed. There's been dishonesty, possibly even theft. But the idea of Christians taking each other to court is unthinkable to Paul unthinkable. And again, these are minor issues. It's not because someone in the congregation killed another member. These are minor issues, as the passage will show us. But Paul here is absolutely furious. And unfortunately, our English translation doesn't really catch the, catch the force of it. What do I mean by that? You'll notice in verse 1, in the middle of your verse, you'll find the word dare. Right? If you've got a dispute, dare one of you go and do this. In the original language, we've got an English translation of the Greek, right? In the original language, the first word in the sentence is dare. Paul's saying, dare you take your brother to court? Would you be so daring to do something like that? So brazen. Would you do that? And he is furious here. And if you look carefully at verse 1, you see that Paul isn't just stunned that they're having these disputes, but he's stunned by how they are seeking to deal with these, these fights and disputes. Verse 1, Do you dare take your disputes before ungodly for judgment and not before the saints? So there's two possibilities that they could do with their fighting and their cases. They could either take it to the ungodly, which is the world, go to a worldly court, or you can take it to the saints, God's holy people, take it to your local church to sort it out. Who do the Corinthians choose? They choose the secular courts, they choose the ungodly. And so, do you see how perplexed Paul is? Paul's saying this, hold on a second, hold on, hold on, hold on. let me get this straight. The children of God are taking their problems to the children of the devil. God's holy people are seeking counsel from unholy people. Do the righteous, the righteous seek justice from the unrighteous? Are you out of your minds? Have you lost the plot? Paul's furious and he's beside himself. What's Paul's point? If you have differences with your brother and sister, do not take it to the world. Sort it out amongst yourselves. Judge the cases yourselves. Do you see the connection between this passage and last week what Pastor Ian preached with the sexually immoral man who was sleeping with his stepmother? Paul said, I'm not going to judge people outside the church. Rather, is it not our responsibility to judge those inside the church? That's what you've been called to do. And now he's saying, you've got problems in the church and you're taking it to unbelievers to judge. Judge yourselves. This is the church's duty. This is the church's duty. So that's the issue. This is what Paul's dealing with. It's huge. 
Now, Paul's going to use a series of rebukes and warnings and even encouragement to bring these wandering Corinthians back. Because that's what God does. That's how God brings wandering Christians back. We're going to see that. Firstly, the rebuke that their future ministry isn't affecting their present conduct. Their future ministry isn't affecting their present conduct. Look at verses 2 to 3 with me. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? You see, Christians going to secular court against each other is a massive problem in God's eyes. Massive, massive problem. Why? Well, Paul says, firstly, don't you know, Christian, that you're going to judge the world? Now, the New Testament is very clear that God has appointed Jesus Christ to be the judge of the world on the final day. New Testament is very clear. Acts 17, 31. For God has set a day when he'll judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Bad news for the world. The one that you rejected, he's going to be your judge on the final day. New Testament's clear on that. And yet... We also see that Judgment Day, Christians are going to participate in somehow, in some kind of way. Christians are going to participate in it, the judgment of the world. Jude 1, 14 to 15 could be relating to this. He says, See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of His holy ones to judge everyone, to convict all the ungodly. Or... Revelation 20, verse 4, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. I'm not quite sure what role we're going to play in judgment. Can you imagine if we will be judging people who refused our message when we witnessed to them and we shared the gospel? We say, I told you. You didn't listen. I'm not sure. But secondly, he says, don't you know that we'll judge angels? Now, what on earth is going on here? We're going to judge angels? Well, there could be a couple of options here. Either he's referring to us Christians judging fallen angels. Because where where are are many of the fallen angels now? Jude 1 verse 6 tells us, And the angels who did not keep their position of authority but abandoned their own home. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. These fallen angels are awaiting judgment. Maybe we're going to be involved in that. Or when it says we're going to judge angels, it could simply mean that we're going to rule over angels. Judge and rule are used interchangeably in the scriptures, to judge or to rule. Now, now what he could be saying is, in the new heavens and the new earth, we are going to be ruling over the angels, the holy ones, because they're going to be present. Revelation 22, 5, and his people will reign forever and ever. We will be kings with Christ. So perhaps if this is the case for Paul, this is the great reversal, right? Because currently, Christians are persecuted and humiliated. In chapter 4, he said this, verse 9, For us apostles have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as men. Right now, we are suffering, and everyone looks at us and is watching on, even angels. But Paul says, one day, we're going to be ruling over the angels as kings with Christ. Paul says we will judge and rule over angels. He doesn't delve into the how or to what that's going to look like when he says this. That's not his point. What is his point? Paul is saying, if you are destined for all of this, to judge the world, to rule over angels, then how shameful that you can't even judge trivial cases. Angels! The world! And yet a a dispute between two Christians in your church is too difficult. Too difficult. Verse 4, he continues to intensify here. Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. Now, you'll notice you've probably got a footnote there in your Bible. The Greeks really 
um, difficult to translate, and the NIV goes a different way to other translations. The NIV seems to think that Paul's saying, even those who are of no account in your church, the most simple of people in your church, appoint them to be judges. They can do better than the unrighteous. That's the way that the NIV goes. Most other translations uh, see Paul uh, as saying a, a rhetorical question here, referring to unbelievers. They interpret it like this. Do you even appoint judges who are of no account to the church? And this seems to fit the context. What he's saying is, do you choose people whom the church doesn't respect at all to judge your cases? And that would seem to fit the context, right? Unbelievers judging you. And hence, we get verse 5. Think of verse 5. I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? He's cutting them down to size here. He really is. Now, this is the irony of what's going on here in this letter to this church. They have been, we've seen, boasting in their wisdom. We have such knowledge. We are so wise. We are like the philosophers of our age. We know so much. And Paul says, are you so wise? You're so wise, are you? And yet there's not even one among you who's wise enough to settle a conflict between two people in your congregation. Isn't that ironic? He is cutting them down. He is cutting them down down. It's a rebuke. You see, both are essential. We need to encourage, but we also need a rebuke. We also need a warn. Both are vital, and Paul is doing this to humble them and bring them back. Bring them back. Verse 5, I say this to shame you. Interesting. In chapter 4, he's dealing with their pride and boasting. And in verse 14, he says, I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you. In chapter 6, I say this to shame you. Now I'm shaming you. Now I'm shaming you. And again, the irony in all of it. You're putting each other on trial. You want to win against each other. Guess what? I've put you on trial and you've been found guilty before the Lord. You're guilty, absolutely guilty. So that's the first rebuke. Their future ministry, that they're going to judge and rule the world, isn't affecting their present. Secondly, he rebukes them that they are destroying their witness. They're destroying their witness. You see this in verses 6 and 7. Paul had just asked rhetorically, is there not one wise enough among you to judge? What was the answer to that question? There wasn't. There wasn't. Look at verse 6. Instead, one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. This is really bad, isn't it? This is very, very bad. You can see why Paul is so distressed and devastated by this, right? It, it, it's distressing enough that you have these fights among you and disputes. But how woefully terrible is it that you're showing your fights to the world? You're showing it to the world, to unbelievers. You're doing this, he says, in front of unbelievers. What would be going through the unbelieving world's eyes? What would be going through their minds when they witnessed these lawsuits? What would an unbeliever think when they saw this court case? You know as well as I do that the world loves a church scandal. They love it. You know as well as I do that the media will absolutely pounce and stop all printing to get on top of a story about a church scandal. These people who tell us how to live, look at them. Paul says you're doing it in front of unbelievers. In front of unbelievers. And I ask you, do unbelievers need more excuses than they already have for rejecting Christ? They already think that Noah's Ark is a magical fairy tale. 
They already love their sin and hate God's laws. They hate hearing about sin, their guilt, and the judgment to come. They hate hearing that they need a Savior. On top of all of that, do they now need to see us fighting each other? You're doing it in front of unbelievers. Paul can't believe it. Paul can't handle it. See, we destroy our witness when we do this and we actually further harden unbelievers in their rejection of God. And that scares me. That scares me. To further harden unbelievers from trusting in Christ. Look how he adds adds weight to this, what he's doing here. He's very purposeful with his words. He says, brother against brother in front of unbelievers. Do you know in the letter to the Corinthians, he uses the word brother 39 times. 39 times. Now, he could have said to them, believer or church member against church member in front of unbelievers. He could have said that. But he chooses to use the word brother against brother. Why does he do that? What's going on here? He's reminding them, you are brothers and sisters in Christ. The Lord Jesus is your elder brother. You've been brought into the family of God, and the family of God is fighting in front of unbelievers. Hence why he says, I say this to shame you. I say this to shame you. You're suing one another, and you're taking your your cases to the world. You see, when he said this, when he wrote these words, when this letter would have been read out to the Corinthians, there should have not been one dry eye in that congregation. That place should have been filled with weeping. Weeping. Brother against brother. Jesus had said, Jesus himself had said, by this the world will know that you're my disciples, by your love for one another. And the Lord Jesus Christ looks down at his church with a broken heart. With a broken heart. Fighting each other. And so, fast forward in the letter of 1 Corinthians and you get to that incredible chapter, chapter 13. That chapter on love. Love is patient, it's kind. It does not wrong another. It's not self-seeking. That passage has got nothing to do with marriage, does it? When you understand what's going on in Corinth, you start to see Paul wasn't writing about marriage. You might be thinking as you're listening and you're looking at this text, chapter 6, thinking, this, this, this doesn't apply to me in any way at all. I have never sued another Christian and I never will sue another Christian. Maybe. Maybe that's true. But how common is it for Christians to take their problems that they have with other Christians to unbelievers and vent out their frustrations. This per- when they go to work, this, this person at church, they always do this. My pastor, he always says this. My church always does this. They teach these things. People in our congregation, they do this. And we air out our dirty laundry for the world to see. Or, in other more common circumstances, when Christians, we're probably all, all of us are guilty of this, when Christians bicker and fight on social media for the world to watch. The world looks on as Christians, brothers and sisters, fighting, arguing, tearing each other down as an unbelieving world watches on. You see, when we do this, we destroy our witness. We make the family of God unattractive. We are supposed to be a radiant bride And we give the world another excuse to keep rejecting Christ and refuse to repent. Verse 7a, look at it with me. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Wow. Isn't that an amazing statement? You're taking each other to court to win? Guess what? If you go to court against your brother before the case is even heard, you've already lost. You've lost You've been defeated. The plaintiff, the plaintiff has lost. The defendant has lost. The whole church has lost. You've lost your witness. You've lost everything. You were the salt of the earth. That's gone now. 
You were the light of the world. That's gone now. You were a city on a hill. That's gone now. You've already been defeated. What will it cost? What will it cost you? So he's rebuked them that they're losing their witness. Next, he rebukes them that they look nothing like Christ. Nothing like Christ. Look at verse, second half of verse 7 with me. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? When he says this, Paul is touching on a foundational truth about true Christianity. This gets to the heart of Christianity. Christians are to be forgiving. When we are wronged, forgive. When you are cheated, forgive. Jesus gives that extraordinary parable in Matthew chapter 18. And he says there was a servant who had this incredible debt to the king. He couldn't repay it. And the servant's freaking out because he knows what's going to happen to him. And the king graciously forgives the massive debt that he owes him. He says, you don't have to repay it. That servant goes and walks off. He had many servants underneath him who owed him money. And he began to beat them, grab them, take hold of them, and even lock them in prison until they repaid him. Well, news gets back to the king. What does the king do? The king says, take that worthless servant and hand him over to the torturers. Jesus, whoa, that's, that's, that's a brutal parable. He hasn't even given the lesson yet. What is he going to say? So shall my Father in heaven also do to you if each of you do not forgive their brother from the heart. This is very, very serious. We've been forgiven so much through Christ, and shall we not forgive another? Shall we not forgive if we can't forgive when we've been wronged? Shall we expect forgiveness from God? And, 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 and please hear me, this gets to the very heart of our lives, doesn't it? It really gets right where we're at when Paul says, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? What's he saying here? Why not rather let it slide? See, in a room this full tonight, it's highly possible, highly likely that there are some here who have not forgiven their brother or sister in Christ. That some of you have taken your brother or sister to court in your heart so that they'll pay. And they are paying because you don't show them any love. You don't bless them. You don't do good to them when you see them. You avoid them and you treat them like an unbeliever. God's word is very, very clear tonight. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? If fighting and divisions will make us risk losing everything, then why not rather, why not rather cop the hit, absorb the blow, take the punch, be struck? Isn't this the essence of true Christianity? What did Paul say in chapter 4? What was his example? In chapter 4, he says this, When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we speak kindly. And, and doesn't this exactly represent and show us the heart of the Master? Isn't this the example that He left us? He taught us in Matthew chapter 5. He said, But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, offer them the other cheek also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. So Jesus taught us. Why not absorb it instead? And Jesus wasn't just a teacher. He was a man of righteousness. He was betrayed by Judas. He was rejected by his own people, Israel. His own family and siblings didn't believe in him. He was in a court case where he was spat upon and punched and beaten. There were false witnesses. And what does it say in all of it? Isaiah 53. Yet... As a lamb is, is silent on the way to its shearers, unto the slaughterhouse, so Christ did not open his mouth. He absorbed it all. He absorbed all of it. Why? To die for us, to pay for our sin. 
Christ leaves us the example. And Paul says here, the Corinthians have forgotten our Lord's pattern. They've forgotten the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he rebukes them for it. He gives another warning here and another rebuke. Listen to the warning of verses 8 and 10. We see that he warns them of the possibility of losing out on heaven. The possibility of losing out on heaven. Verse 8. Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Severe warning here. The kingdom of God is at stake, church. The kingdom of God. What is, what is the kingdom of God? This is the rule and reign of Christ. Whenever someone believes our message of the gospel, Colossians 1 tells us, they are transferred from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. They're brought into the kingdom of God. When is the kingdom of God fully realized? When every single believer is gathered in. Those who've died and those who are present when Christ returns, and he establishes his reign, and it's just his people. And, and he rules in righteousness. That is the kingdom of God. That is eternal life. That is heaven. Paul says, you might not get there. You might not get it. You're risking losing your witness. You're risking losing your eternal inheritance. How can that be? Well, Paul says, make no mistake, read it carefully, the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. If the Corinthians think that they'll get to heaven despite the way that they live, they're dead wrong. They are dead wrong. If we think, if anyone thinks, no matter what they profess, no matter what they call themselves, if they think they're getting to heaven despite the way they live, they are dead wrong because the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's as plain as that. A person may call themselves a Christian. A person may say that they are born again, but the true state and position of that person will be evidenced by their life. It will be evidenced by their life. And so Paul now lists 10 types of sinners. It's not an exhaustive list, but the list that he gives reflects a type of sin that's going on in the church at Corinth. Really, this list rep reveals the character and conduct of the unbelieving world, but these sins had crept into the church. And so Paul offers a threat. He lists 10 types of sinners. Let's briefly look at them. I've only got a few moments. Sin number one, the sexually immoral. Now, this is addressed in the previous chapter, right? The man sleeping with his mother, and next week we're going to see they were visiting prostitutes. Paul says they're sexually immoral, they're not getting in. They're not getting in. Now this word here, it's a very broad term. It can refer to sex outside of marriage, as we saw last week, or it can refer simply to any sexual impurity, looking at pornography, indulging in pornography. Understand this, if you are sexually impure, you should be very, very afraid. You should be afraid. Are you sexually impure? Do you use your phone or your laptop as a digital brothel? You should be very afraid. You should be afraid. Are you doing this? Is this a part of your life, of your lifestyle? Second sin, type of sinner he mentions are idolaters. We're going to see idolatry in chapters 8 to 10. Understand this, to believe in the Muslim God, to believe in Hindu gods is idolatry. They're not the true God. If you think that God is just some higher force out there, which most people that you evangelize to, he's just something up there, that's idolatry. It's not the true God. Even if you believe in the God of the Bible, but you slightly adjust him, he's all loving, he's all kind, he's all gracious, he's all forgiving, he's not judging. He won't send people to hell. He'll let everyone in. 
That's idolatry. You've changed God. You've changed God. But it's even more subtle than that. If you love anything or anyone more than God, you are an idolater. You're guilty of idolatry. And idolatry comes in the form of family, sport, entertainment, pleasure. They are all the West's golden calf. All of those things have become the golden calf of the West. Idolaters will not enter. Third sin, adulterers. Adulterers, this is those who cheat on their spouse, those who are unfaithful in marriage, or those who sleep with another person's spouse, or those who divorce unlawfully, or those who married who marry someone who's divorced unlawfully. It's adultery. That's adultery. Let me combine sins four and five. You'll see there in verse nine, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders. Now, the Greek is very, very graphic here. Very, very explicit. I'm just going to say it in one shot. This refers to the active participant in homosexual intercourse and the passive participant in homosexual intercourse. Paul covers everything, everything, not getting in, not getting in, if you live that way. Those who act on that, not getting in. And this very first, isn't it, isn't it interesting? This is the verse that condemned Israel Folau. This is the verse that he quoted. Sin 6 and 7, nor thieves or the greedy. Now, greed in this context is found in this chapter, right? Suing your brother and sister for gain. It's happening in the church. But greed here is referring also to coveting. Wanting something that you don't have. Always wanting what you don't yet have. And understand this. This is the most respectable sin in society today. Covetousness. Greed. It's scarcely even considered a sin today, let alone it's never, it is certainly not something that will exclude someone from getting to heaven. No way, right? In the West, this is prevalent amongst us. Always looking for a better paying job. Why? So you can have more money. Always looking for a high income. Why? So you can buy things that other people have. Always needing to have the bigger TV. Always needing to have the newer car, the bigger house, the better things, the most expensive clothes. Always needing to have more and better. Always an upgrade. It's covetousness. And covetous will have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. It's strong, isn't it? I have to have that. I need to have that thing. So Paul's addressing here. How many who call themselves Christians, who call themselves Christians, live this way? How many? How many? Did I just describe you? Did I just describe you? How full are churches of people who will be shut out of the kingdom of God? Jesus says, narrow is the gate that leads to life and only a few will find it. I'm, I'm, I'm lumping the greedy and thieves together. Why? The greedy long for what they don't have. Thieves simply take it. Both are guilty. Sin, eight. Drunkards. This comes up in the church, doesn't it? Chapter 11. They're getting drunk at the Lord's Supper when they're having communion. They're getting drunk on the wine. Now, understand this. I'm going to say one thing about it. Alcohol is not a sin. Drunkenness is. Drunkenness is. Sin number nine, slanderers, literally verbal abusers, those who use their mouth as weapons to destroy others. They're not getting in. And sin number 10, swindlers. This is, we don't really use that word much, but it's frauds. Those who sell false goods and rob people, faulty products, charlatans, prosperity gospel preachers. Give more money, God will bless you. That's one example. Swindlers will have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Why is Paul saying all of this? There's ten, ten types of sin. It's not exhaustive. This. Why is he doing this? He's reminding that when God saves a person, he saves them to transform them. 
to make them like His Son, not to put a name badge Christian on them and let them live like the world. He changes them. He's in the business of transforming them. And so Paul gives this. He gives these hard words to show them their lovelessness and it's to make them repent, to bring them to sorrow and to seek the mercy of Christ for the sin that they've fallen into. Christians fall into these sins. But he's rebuking and warning them to bring them back. Paul has one last thing to lead them to repentance, and I'll finish on this. Now he gives an encouragement. Rebuke and encouragement. And Paul Paul uses both. Look at verse 11. He reminds them how God powerfully saved them. Look at verse 11. And that is what some of you were, that list there. That's what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This is an extraordinary verse. Homosexuals, drunkards, thieves, That's who you used to be. That was a list of your old self. That was your church. That's who you used to be, but you're not that anymore. That's who you once were. He's giving a uh, before and after shot, right? You know when we see those before and after shots of people who are on a diet, the old photo of when they're at maximum weight, the before shot, that's old self. That list that we just saw of sinners, that was the old them. That's who they used to be. And what's extraordinary is they who were sexually perverse were made pure. Those who were drunks were made sober. Those who were thieves are now people of integrity. He's changed them. Those who were idolaters now worship the one true God. Understand this, there is no institution, no rehab, no counseling on the face of the earth that can bring that kind of change. There's nothing. There's nothing on the planet that can do that. So how did the impossible happen? How did it happen? Look at verse 11. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. What happened? The Trinity acted. The Trinity acted. He says, you were washed. The old self was cleansed. At the beginning I said, a Christian is a new creation. You were washed. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. New birth, being born again. This is the Holy Spirit's work. When he makes someone dead alive, he changes them. He says, you were sanctified. This again is the Holy Spirit's work. Sanctified means to set apart and to make holy. You once lived for the devil and for yourself, and now he's made you set apart for God. You were once wicked and unholy. He's now making you a holy people. The Holy Spirit did that. The Holy Spirit did that. And he says, you were justified. You were justified. This means you were made right before God. Don't you understand? You were criminals in God's sight. You were condemned. You were guilty. The guillotine was waiting. And now you are declared righteous and innocent. How did that happen? Because 2,000 years ago, church, the Lord Jesus Christ died as a substitute for sinners and he paid for our sin. We were washed, and Paul says, you didn't just get cleaned, you got dressed up in the Lord Jesus Christ. He sees you in Christ. You are clothed in Christ, washed and dressed. The Holy Spirit has done this. And so Paul reminds them of this. Paul reminds them of this. This is the encouragement. Remember what you were. How mighty was God in transforming you? Don't go back. Don't go back. Church, he rebukes and he encourages. And for any who are straying, you might be straying here tonight, take the rebukes. Take the rebukes. It's for your good. But take the encouragement. Remember who you were before the Trinity stepped in? And if you are lost tonight, if you are not right with Christ... If you are not right with Christ, seek mercy. 
Otherwise, the door of heaven will be shut in your face. That's what Paul says. May the Lord use his word for all of us here tonight. Let me pray. Lord, it is a strange thing that the mess and sin of Corinth is to our benefit. Because of the wickedness that happened in this church, we can learn and we can avoid what they went through. We thank you for scripture. We thank you for your word. Truly, it is a two-edged sword. It hurts and it cuts and it exposes us. But at the same time, your word is also sweet as honey from the comb. It gives life. It revives us. It restores us. And I pray for any who are straying tonight in sin. I pray that you would be using your word tonight to bring your people back in. Back in. Back onto that narrow path. The narrow path that leads to life. And Lord, for any who are lost, any who are in in sin and who are not right with Christ, the list of sinners resembles them in this passage. I pray, O God, that they would seek mercy and find forgiveness while there's still time. Cause them to believe in your Son for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for your word. May you bless it to us now that your Son might be honored and we might be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. We're now going to have...